size of these novels, this franchise is overwhelming. I mean, it's just, it's um, an international, one of the highest selling book franchises of all time. I mean, th those are big shoes to fill. I'm in now, um, up in Toronto for, I'm up here for, for Jack Reacher. So I'm, you know, I live in a farmhouse that looks like a hotel lobby. <laughs> wow, look at that chandelier and everything. Right? <laughs> 200 years old, bro. 200 years old. That's yeah. fancy living, you know? I'd say so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, hey, thanks for taking the time to to talk to me here. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm sure you got better, bigger and better things to do, but uh, I've been know. looking forward to chatting with you. I don't know. Thanks, you too. So, you know what? I, I got to dive into this. Um, what prompted you to take on the dark web? Because you co-wrote this and obviously directed it, but man, uh, th that's that's an interesting concept in itself. And I saw that it was based on like some inspired by true events. Is that true too? Afterwards, which kind of blew my mind. Right. Yeah. So, I, so I was I was looking for uh, material to write. You know, um, it's it's important to have some kind of IP that relates to what you're doing for people to understand what you, what you're making. And uh, I stumbled upon this doing research. And just was really taken by Cicada 3301 and these recruitment games. There's a lot of speculation about who Cicada 3301 is, what they want, and uh, who's behind these games. Um, some people said they were CIA or NSA recruitment tools, um, but it diverged from sort of normal recruitment tool style um, uh, games and um, branched out uh, off the computer and um, one, one puzzle unlocked QR codes in, in several continents around the world. And all at the same time, people go up and they, the ones that got there first uh, received a call that kind of invited them in closer. And it's just a very intriguing world that was built around um, these ideas. And, um, and then on top of that, the thematics of Cicada 3301, you know, they, they would educate you in these recruitment games, you know, so you'd, you, you'd see a picture and then someone would hack the picture and there'd be another image with a riddle in it. And then that riddle would have a cipher. And then you'd unlock a code to GPS coordinates or whatever. It just kept going. Um, but at, along the way, they would, through those riddles or those ideas, they would educate you on what their their belief system was. And mm. so maybe with ideas like the institution versus the individual or um, what kind of world order we should have or how self-reliant we should be versus how, uh, how willing we should be uh, to be governed, you know? So um, so I just thought that was a really interesting uh, fodder for a film. And I like wrestling with those ideas. And I, I think I needed to figure that out and to, to, to wrestle with that through this medium, um, it just felt right for me. Um, but all that said, that's not interesting to everybody. <laughs> you <know>? like, <laughs> sure, you gotta make it entertaining, right? No. So I, so I, you know, I, I endeavored to make uh, something that is broadly enjoyable. That whether you understand Cicada and, and what they're about, uh, whether you have any understanding of the history of what's really happened, um, or whether you you like tech related stuff or not, it didn't matter to me as much as making something that people can just escape to for an hour and a half and enjoy. Um, so it became sort of a genre blending thing, you know, where we, you know, wrestle with these ideas with a sense of seriousness, but there's also this um, we subvert expectations with this unreliable narrative device where you're taking down these rabbit holes where the world becomes really magical and you're wondering what's real and what isn't. And that's a lot of fun. Um, and there's a lot of comedy and humor in it. So it's, you don't have to know anything about Cicada, what they're about, or about computers or tech to enjoy this film. And that, that's what was most important um, to me. Um, but, you know, I think it just makes for a good, good movie. No question. And I like how you blend it in. The humor is there for sure, you know, <laughs> getting thrown out of a van or whatever else, you know, is going on in there. There's there's, there's a lot of funny, especially you, uh, your banter going on um, that you have in there. But the thing is, like, how do you blend that in as a director and writer? Because there's so many moving parts and visuals, too. And then obviously the, the characters are kind of, in a sense, lighthearted with a, a kind of a deep theme in a sense. Uh, how do you blend that in? Did that present challenges for you to to hit on so many different kind of, um, you know, in a sense, genres, but but styles and just blending all sorts of things and not making like a straight cut, sort of just a dark thriller in a sense, because I, I would think that's, in a sense, a lot to juggle, but it 
certainly makes sense when you put this movie together. Was that a challenge or did it come easier to you because you incorporated so many different elements to this film? Yeah, good question. I, it was one of the bigger challenges I faced in making this. You know, I mean, um, Jack Kessie, who played Connor Black, the lead character, um, is brilliant. I mean, in, uh, you know, if you've seen the film, I think you'd agree. It's um, He's a very raw, natural performer, very grounded, very real. And it was really challenging to help him understand where this was funny you know where the comedy was in this because everything's so you know i we hired somebody who's a real actor you know and i think a lot of people have a hard time um marrying those ideas of comedy and a real performance you know so for him he's like i don't know you're trying to tell me to do it like this and this and that's going to be funny but is this funny and i'm like it's going to be funny he's like but it doesn't seem funny, you know? I'm like, but it's gonna be funny because the, you know, uh -huh. just the way it plays with the rest of the stuff, you are you know, then you realize it's, you, you're messing with everybody. It actually makes you smarter, you know? And he, so we'd have to like really, I'd work hard to get him to understand what the comedy was gonna look like, you know? Um, Cause on the page it read, if you, if you read this, I mean, there's moments of funny, but it's not like a laugh out loud comedy, you know, we're not making wedding crashers. Like this is, it's not Dumb and Dumber. It's It reads like a thriller. And so for somebody to read it, a lot of the crew and a lot of the talent had a hard time going like, like I would come on, to, I played Agent Carver in the film, this kind of sort of bumbling right. idiot from the NSA and um, his partner, Agent Sullivan, is this older actor, Andrea Apergy, who absolutely crushed the role. Um, but you've got these two kind of bumbling NSA idiots. And we come. In, I'd come into a scene with Jack Kesey and I, we would just sort of go off book and he was really good at that, you know? So it made it for me to go, like, I could just say whatever. And he's always listening. So he'd respond with like some great remark that's not on the script. And we get done with the scene and he's like, oh, that was really funny. I didn't think it was gonna be so funny. Well, why is it so funny? <laughs> like, <laughs> you gotta trust the director there, right? I mean, you know, that so, one. You know, a lot of times, you know, the, the crew would come over and they'd be like, are you sure? That was really funny. Uh, are, they, are we making a comedy, you know? The whole time, it was just educating people on 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 how we can blend genres. People aren't used to seeing genre blending. Even selling this film, a lot of distributors were like, I don't, "We don't really know how to sell a film. It's like it's not. It's funny, but it's not a comedy, and it's like not a. It's like it's a drama, but it's also like I laughed a lot, and you know, it's a very confusing thing. But I think filmmakers are helping us steer more and more towards a world where films have those organic qualities of just many experiences instead of just being one straight easy to sell idea it's a horror film or it's a thriller a suspense or it's an action movie you know i mean i think films I, I think to continue to cut through the noise have to be more than one thing that's what our lives look like we want it to yeah. match it, you know no question I, I i i would kind of refer to this movie as a as a thriller with a lot of personality you know that's great i'll take it yeah, okay. I, I think that's perfectly said because it, it like when you do, I think it's exciting when, when you mentioned that blending different genres because uh, it, it makes it more relatable then, you know, because sometimes you just kind of put into this crazy world like, oh, can I really imagine is this real? But when there's personality in, in the actors and characters, even it makes like the most kind of serious topics, it makes it more relatable through the characters and actors. So okay. I think as soon as you get a movie, especially one that shows a computer screen, you know, if it's even remotely technically in, you know, if it's, it's computer related at all, I think if it takes itself too seriously, 90% of the people are going like, I don't care. I, uh, yeah. uh, make me up when it's over. Like we look at screens all day. Everybody's savvy technically these days. I mean, um, you know, I think, like you said, to make it relatable, I think it can't take itself too seriously, or, you know, or else like, we're, you know, uh, it just, I, I just think it misses what audiences really want, which is an opportunity to escape for a few minutes. Man, you're you're in a chandelier house. You look ripped and buff. I mean, you must be doing Jack Reacher then, because you are prime and ready for that. Tell me, I, yeah. I mean, everyone's gonna recognize Jack Reacher. You know, think Tom Cruise right away. And obviously, this is a gonna be a series, kind of like John Krasinski did with um, with, with uh, his Amazon series too. But tell me about this. Is there, was there any trepidation, kind of going into role, knowing that it's Tom Cruise? You know, that that people recognize the Jack Reacher name by, and you kind of, or, or did you want to make it completely your own and distance it from from that? Uh, any sort of pressure or, or expectation did you feel you had to live up to doing this? 
Um, you know, I mean, I think you, you mentioned Tom, these, you know, Jack Reacher's shoes are big enough to fill metaphorically. I mean, mm -hmm. this is, uh, you know, the, the size of these novels, this franchise is overwhelming. I mean, it's just, it's um, an international, one of the highest selling book franchises of all time. I mean, th those are big shoes to fill. And then you throw um, Tom, who is, I uh, can only express gratitude for what he did. I mean, he, he brought even more eyes to this. And um, despite his stature, which is sort of irrelevant, he still carried um, the weight of who this guy in this this uh, this series is represents, you know. So, um, I mean, who else can have you know could have pulled that off? I, I I don't know. I mean, he's it's remarkable what he did, and and I think um, he he opened the door to a lot more people to enjoy Jack Reacher because of his work. So. Um, you know, there's, it's so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, I mean, I'd be lying if the, I said it wasn't a little intimidating stepping, in, stepping into a role that 110 million people already have an idea as to who you are, you know, um, but, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, Skydance and Amazon and everybody involved is, um, you know, they, they feel confident with, with, uh, you know, the work that I was bringing to the character early on. And, um, so I just keep doing what seems to be working and, I'm a huge Jack Reacher fan. I mean, I've read the books and I just can't tell you enough how, how big of a fan I am. I want to get it right, both, you know, for the fans, but because I am one, you know, I mean, I, I desperately want to get it right because I love this guy. I just think he's one of the coolest characters of all time. So, um, you know, but, but at the end of the day, you just take it one, one, one day at a time, one beat at a time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's what I'm doing, you know, you know, I got you here. I got to ask you, man. It's, I want to kind of clarify, I, you know, obviously I grew up with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So when the movie came out and you, you played Raphael, that was like a thing, you know, because I remember even like the late 80s, uh, early 90s, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, is that true that, that you didn't have the experience in a sense that you were hoping for on that film or it didn't turn out the way you wanted to? Uh, I, I kind of want to hear your thoughts, you know, because it's in a sense, like, I think they're rebooting it again. And it just came out like literally a few years ago, you know, um, what are kind of your thoughts on that, that whole experience? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, I'm grateful for the experience. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for, for being a part of the film. I mean, I signed up to do that because I thought it'd be an amazing, uh, cool part of our story as a, as, as a family for my, my boys to be able to grow up yeah. knowing like, Oh, we had a hand in that, you know, we were there when that was happening. That's cool. Um, I was a fan as a kid. I'm still a fan. Um, it was a tough experience, you know, and, um, I think, uh, doing this sort of cutting edge live action animation, um, which really we're still very much at the Genesis of that technology. Um, it taught us that there are a lot of loopholes that we need to close to protect the actors. Um, it gets very easy to exploit people when, um, you, you know, um, you can sort of rebuild and reanimate their work over and over and over again, you know? Um, um, so it, it's, uh, it was tough. It was a tough process, but, but I'm, but I'm grateful for it and, uh, I'm better for it now because if I'm ever invited into that style of filmmaking again, I know exactly what we have to do to, you know, protect ourselves from, from, you know, from being exploited from our time and our, our, our energy being exploited. I think that's well said. I, I think a lot of sometimes actors who, who in a sense are now digitized, you know what I mean? You, you forget about that. That's actually an actual human that's being, uh, you know, behind that and not just like a, in a sense of voiceover or not. So I think that's really important that you mention that because with today's technology, it, it seems like we're we're forgetting about the actor you know person just making it like a thing a, a computerized thing which is not the case so uh, I'm, right. I'm glad you actually kind of said that too um would you ever do it again i mean a reboot or whatnot you know would you ever consider it if, if they did it differently um yeah, look, I've I've learned to never say never, um, but uh, <clears throat> probably not. <laughs> I'd be very unlikely. You know, it was uh, it was it was too easy to you know you you mentioned almost objectifying an actor when a performance is, is digitized, and that's exactly what it is. I mean, um, it was too easy to um, to 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 dissect the performer from the character. 
you know, and you can't do that. And, you know, uh, April O'Neil was Megan Fox. And so you can't have some other version of Megan Fox show up at a red carpet in China. You know, um, you can't separate her because it's still her face, you know, and they were able to separate us from the characters. And, and I think they thought that would be better for uh, their brand or the, themselves or whatever to sort of limit our exposure. And um, and so that, you know, it's just easy to do that. And I'm not I'm not um, I'm not really looking to get involved in that kind of filmmaking again because of that. But, you know, if there's like I said, if you know, n there's an awareness now of what happens when you do that. And, um, you know, I get that kind of stuff in writing. But, um, we, yeah, I mean, we, we really put a lot of blood, sweat and tears in that for years. And um, they made sure that nobody knew, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so I don't, I'm not looking to get involved again, but you know, like I said, never say never. Well, you're on a good path. I'm telling you. And it's cool that you're a director because you notice these things and certainly actors can feel comfortable, you know, working with you even behind the, behind the lens, because you understand the actor's work. And I think that's really cool that, that you have that perspective as an actor and now as a filmmaker. So uh, looking forward to more of your directing. I know there's another film in the pipeline for you, so uh, I'm excited about that. And of course, can't wait for Jack Reacher. Uh, Alan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Been a longtime fan of yours. Uh, and, and it's really cool to see your career evolving now to the Lex level and kind of branching out into directing. Uh, I can't wait to see what's next. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for the great answers and honesty and taking your time. Sure, sure. Thanks, man. Take care. Good luck. Catch down the road. Later.